You can listen to The Professional Left wherever you get your podcasts on Netroots Radio or at our website, proleftpod.com, where you can also contribute to this podcast. There's a PayPal button at our website, or you can mail us a letter and or contribution at P.O. Box 9133, Springfield, Illinois, 62791. This is the podcast for July 9th, 2021. It's not safe for work. Recorded live from the Cornfield Resistance, where we may be off the beaten path, but we know how taxes work. It's the professional left with Drift Class and Blue Gal. Hey, everybody. Hey, Blue Gal. Hi, Drift Glass. I'm just waking up. You know, it's it's early in the morning. It's like five o'clock here. The roosters just crowed, and I'm just it's like four in the afternoon. Drift oh yeah, Glass. that's right. Oh, it's four fifteen <laughs> in the afternoon. I've been listening to conservative podcasts all day, and I don't feel good at all in my tummy. But um, and we'll actually, get to that later. we had a lovely lunch. You made an onion omelet with spinach and feta and all kinds of good stuff in it. Yes, and I then did. we sat down to work on show notes. Where we're recording on. Thursday, ap- yeah. late afternoon Thursday, because I've discovered that that gives me a little more yeah. time and breathing space, and I, it isn't a 12-hour day on Friday, and that's good for me, my mental and health. I've, <laughs> I've learned that um, you're in less of a murderous mood um, exactly. on Friday evening, which <laughs> works for me. That's great for me, too. So it's win-win for everybody. Yeah. And, while, and there, there's, there's things we might miss. Like, for example, I just looked over my shoulder and Literally over my shoulder, and there's Matthew Dowd on MSNBC who mm-hmm. just followed up Charlie Sykes on MSNBC. So that kind of breaking important news, uh, we might slip for a day, uh, but the big stuff we usually get, and we usually get it right. And John Bolton was on MSNBC earlier yeah. oh, today it's, too. It's, so and it's, I just, it's vacation week. You know, they're going to have on who people who are willing to come on. So. Well, there are. This is where you and I must disagree. Um, there are a million liberals out there who'd be who delighted love to, to be on, on MSNBC uh, this week. No, we're not going to have any of them on. We're <laughs> yeah. going to have a never Trumper and a never Trumper and Matthew Dowd, whose past su- mysteriously disappeared, and John Bolton, yeah. um, because that's how we roll. Because that's what the way Nicole Wallace wants it to be. Um, and, and Chuck who, Todd and Chuck Todd yeah. and Joe Scarborough and the people who really run that network. Yeah. So yeah, I uh, agree with you. I it, it's weird. Literally looking over my shoulder and saying, hey, look, it's uh, it's the guy I wrote about this morning, Matthew Dowd. Isn't that exciting? Um, anyway. And I uh, want to congratulate you, Drift Glass. What did I do? 10,000 posts at driftglass.blogspot.com. That's true. Well, 10,001. Well, congratulations. 10, yeah, well, thank you. That Suddenly, I'm very tired. Um, <laughs> my hands hurt and my eyes hurt and I'm very tired. <laughs> Um, and I have uh, this is this is somewhat embarrassing, but also correct me up. I have five hundred and forty one in draft. Oh well, of course you do. I have five hundred forty one posts that I abandoned, mm-hmm. or I wrote until I got you know this bores me. Forget it. Um, I have a long one about Jonah Goldberg. Um, well, it's the stuff that you started over later on too, yeah. and just forgot that you'd already started something. I do that. You yeah. know, that's a writer's um, thing. Yeah, and just stuff. And it's interesting to go back through what was a draft post in two thousand and seven mm-hmm. and go mm-hmm. wow uh, lots of change uh, has changed and nothing has changed nothing has changed um, so this week i did a, a a post about i pulled from the austin chronicle from 2004 about the bright and heady future of pod or bro, uh, blogging rather blogging blogging and my it was just it was such a, a bittersweet trip down memory lane yeah yeah um it was going to be the alternate press and web TV was a failure and Napster was, you know, uh, discredited. But this blogging thing, that's got some legs. And the thing that cracked me up, two things that cracked me up about it. First were the mention in the article about how comments sections are what set this whole thing apart. The, <laughs> the most interesting sort of fruitful, interactive conversation, you know, that these people can really get past the filters of the mainstream media and really have conversations with people. I'm like, oh, shit. Yeah. I remember I remember comment section. I still have one, but I'm about the only one who does. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, it, so that cracked me up because nobody has comment sections anymore. Or, or if they do, they, are, they have to be patrolled because trolls have ruined everything. Or they have, they have an outsourced it. Crooks and Liars yeah. has outsourced theirs because we can't manage it it's too much there's too many trolls out there yeah and the trolls won Mm -hmm. in that respect yeah and and the other thing that made it just a perfect 2004 moment was they mentioned three specific blogs in this and linked to them the first one was abandoned the second one was um uh, prohibited 
And the third one was, um, oh, the, I'm sorry, the second one had, hadn't had a post since 2006. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and the third one was a link to the wrong blog. So <laughs> it was just, it was such a lovely little trip down those innocent times. Uh, but it did lead me into sort of this larger um, exploration of what happened to the liberal blogosphere. And I'm, a, I'm still a liberal blogger and I will be for you know at least another five posts. Um, and what happened to the right? Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. and it turned out that if you want to really change the media conversation, you have to have bloggers. But those bloggers had better be tied into radio and television and think tanks and other people who have huge megaphones. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and the right did that. They built, they spent billions of dollars building a giant megaphone of chattering heads um, who who all talked the same language and all interacted with each other and all they created a whole ecosystem into which uh, right wing bloggers fed and became sort of their farm system and they brought people along and brought them up that never happened on the left um, and and the right was able to bulldoze its way into the mainstream media they were they were able to turn Fox News into a legitimate network that has a seat at the table and is at, at press conferences and is treated. As like like ABC, NBC, and CBS, which it mm-hmm. profoundly is not. Um, there is no such equivalent on the left. So there was a moment in as the Bush administration was collapsing. I'm sure you remember this when there was a moment when it looked like liberal bloggers might actually change the media conversation. Right, right. Might actually bend it towards both sides. Don't. Well, and Marcos was on Meet the Press. <laughs> yeah, what, that right? one time for, for one one time. Yeah, right. Uh, well, Michelle Malkin was on this week with. And so there, it's sort of balancing her book, but, that but went who, well. <laughs> but who won that? Who won that fight? Yeah, I mean yeah. that now you can't swing a dead cat on without having a former right wing blogger or a never Trump blogger or some Republican person uh, just dominating the media, dominating the mainstream media. Uh, they're everywhere, and meanwhile, the left was never able to penetrate into the mainstream media and stop it. And the thing that Fox could do, and all of it, all of the other folks could do, was insist that the mainstream media take its framing seriously and demand that that they get 50% of everything so that no matter how fucked up and awful uh, Republicans behave for the last 30 years, they were always given, well, it's the right and the left, the right mm-hmm. and the left, the extremes mm-hmm. on both. They won the both sides do it war because that's, that's the conversation that gives the half the field to Republicans no matter how bad they behave. We were never able to do that because we had no backing. Air America, you know, f- crashed and burned. There was no liberal television. Uh, liberal think tanks are few and far between. And because there was no liberal investment in a larger megaphone, liberal bloggers were just left on their own. And left on their own, we were easy to shove aside. Now, the good news is that I think Joe Biden has learned the lesson of the past two administrations. Well, two let, me, let me stop you there for a moment before we go into Joe Biden, because that's uh-huh. a very large, that's the big, large topic of our yeah. three things I want to mention, just reflecting on what you've said. Sure. One is uh, we had the omelet and then we had the meeting and did. Our, our meeting was going over show notes. Yes. And Drift Glass had been listening to the Bulwark podcast all morning long. <laughs> I've got to really stop him from doing that because it's not good for his mental health. No, and it's not. Everything was, you know, at a level of Matthew Continetti is still around. <laughs> yes. Holy shit. As we started talking, uh, we got into actual news of the week that Joe Biden is doing stuff. That's right. And the the tenor of our whole conversations changed because good things are happening. Yes. And so that's what we want to get into. Mm-hmm. Before we do that, I just want to mention two other things. One is the timeliness of your trip down blog memory lane. Yeah. Um, because this week, USA Today was the last big newspaper to go behind a paywall. And so what we have as it's not st- angry staffer, I think his name is on Twitter. Uh-huh. He said, you know, the re- this is the reason right wing propaganda goes everywhere. Right. It's is free. they are never behind a paywall. Right. And real quote unquote mainstream news, New York Times, Washington Post, USA Today, mm-hmm. and right down to our local newspaper, everything's behind a paywall. Mm-hmm. 
and people just click buy it because right. you can't subscribe to 30 newspapers for 99 cents and then be charged 13.99 or whatever they're going to charge you. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there needs to there there needs to be who am I talking to? <laughs> <laughs> you know, we don't have a financial support for the infrastructure of news. No, we don't. There's only people with agendas trying to push them and that's not good for our country. Well, and then my- oh I'm sorry, my new business model, because I'm done with blogging. You know, <laughs> original content is so 2007, really. Mm-hmm. Um, back when I could just write fuck Bush all day long. And, yeah. You know, well, make a million zillion dollars. I predicted uh, that was going to happen. Oh, you yeah. Know. Suddenly you can't. If you say, can't say fuck Bush, there's no point in blogging during the no. during the uh, Obama administration. Yeah, yeah that was boring. the original great resignation. It yeah, was like, oh, really? all yeah. the blogs are gone. Yeah. Um, but my my uh, business model is based on another business model by someone we both know. Um, I'm going to take USA Today content <laughs> and and give it to you for free <laughs> on my blog because I know you're all you're you're all thirsty for that USA Today hot take on what's going on. I'll even Those have a little infographics. Big, and- yeah, I have a big blue circle and a big orange circle, and you know because you can't get that just anywhere. Like no, like they don't just give that away at hotels across right. the country or motels right. across the country. True, um, but yeah, True no, that. everybody. To make a profit, mm-hmm. everything has gone behind a paywall, right. except for all the free content you can get from from Fox News and mm-hmm. Daily Caller and everything mm-hmm. else on the right, because they are underwritten by billionaires, because right. they have loyal contributors who will send them lots and lots and lots of money, and their message goes everywhere. Um, and ours doesn't, because there is no such, there's absolutely no such, and no interest in any such infrastructure uh, on the left, other than by people like us. Who would like a Christmas tree to hang our ornaments on? Right, but right. Then it can happen. Anyway, you, and then the, the other thing. thing is, we watched a uh, YouTube podcast from our provider, our platform that we yes. put our podcast on, Buzzsprout. Yeah, and I don't know if Buzzsprout is waiting to be purchased by <laughs> some larger concern. They might uh-huh. be, but they do pride themselves, uh, and we've been with them, I think, longer than just about any podcaster that they have on their yeah in their stable um but they do pride themselves on being indie and and That's supporting right. and providing a platform and tech technical support for independent you know not the big ones not the big apple <laughs> podcast you know getting millions and millions of views one of their podcasts actually got 28,000 listens in four weeks something like that and they yeah. said that's in the top one of one percent yep. of audience for everyone that we we host yeah so um and you know we get between four and seven thousand listens per episode here at the professional mm-hmm. Left podcast and thank you for supporting the show yeah but this is something I just wanted to bring up with our listeners because uh, the they actually had one of their podcasters on their podcast to talk about how to make this a full time job. Right. And this guy, he's very well spoken. He hates Facebook. He hates corporate America, but he does reviews of AV equipment, and that's his podcast. And he teach he taught it at the public school system. He was the AV guy. If you remember going to high school and there was an AV guy. I do. Today's AV guy, of course, has a lot more equipment, a lot more savvy students to deal with who want to make, you know, music videos and want to do uh, filmmaking and so forth and can do that digitally because they have a phone and a laptop and that's all you need. Mm-hmm. And so he's been teaching that and he was able through his podcast to quit his job. And they, that's what they were talking about. Cause that's the thing that everybody apparently out there wants to do is have that financial freedom and be able to create content doing what they love. Okay. That's great. The, the point that he made was that I thought, and I'm sorry, I don't remember his name, but the point that he made about, you know, right now you've got Facebook getting into podcasts. You've got Spotify getting, buying, doing a huge investment in podcasts. 
You've got Amazon doing a huge investment in podcasts that might work, might not, and they don't even care. They don't right. even care if it works or not. Like right. <laughs> it's like the Amazon phone, you know, yeah. that failed. We don't care. They right. there's much bigger failures to come down right. the road. <laughs> well, the, and the, the the buying a piece of everything because yep. something is going to work is is well, that and strategy. because you're a dude bro who wants to be in the game with the other dude bros. That's right. part of the the culture of these big companies and their billionaire owners if spotify is into it and makes a sh- makes news by investing a billion dollars in something then i have to invest a billion dollars in something right. too in that same thing and and this podcaster made the point of i am happy to post the um RSS feed of my podcast anywhere that someone wants me to post it Mm -hmm. so that my podcast is available on that platform where someone might drive by and see it and want to listen to it. That's great. Any other investment of time or energy (laughs) is absolutely unavailable. I don't have the time to do it. And, you know, you and I are now recording on Thursday so that on Friday I don't lose my mind and, you know, (laughs) get very stabby (laughs) because I work until noon at Crooks and Liars every day, five days a week, Mm -hmm. and then trying to put together a show that we prep, record, and edit that goes from noon to eight (laughs) at night after having worked nine to twelve. I'm just dead at the end of the day and mm-hmm. and we can't do it. So it's an investment of time. It's an investment of energy and it's a labor of love. Mm-hmm. And that's what the right wing content providers get all of that and the bag of chips of ba- right wing billionaires backing them up. Right. That's the thing. That's the thing. And there is a longstanding, completely um, toxic mm-hmm. belief by frankly, um, lots of boomer liberals mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that you know who who may or may not be very 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 comfortable in their lives. I'm not saying that you know they could build a uh, uh, liberal Fox News on their own. No, but, no. But this notion that you should just do it for the cause, man. Oh, but that's you been should... true since I, for 40 years. Oh, I know, I know. You know? But, but it's but it's insane, and it's a great way to keep losing while feeling you're righteous. Right. You know that you should be able to. You should just you know sleep on a beanbag chair. Eat peanut butter sandwiches. Mm-hmm. That was live in Kennedy a room 80. with twelve other yep. people. Yeah, we live in a room with twelve <laughs> other people. Yeah, and just do that forever because mm-hmm. the cause is righteous. Like, well, okay, if the cause is righteous, write a billion dollar check to it. Oh no, 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 no! I don't want to do that. I want to write a hundred thousand dollar check to the Lincoln Project, but I don't want to actually invest in creating a structure in which we can actually advance progressive ideas in a in a big way because that involves and the the thing that cracks me up and, and frustrates me, and I know it frustrates you, is a lot of the people I'm thinking of own Hollywood studios, mm-hmm. you know, our television executives, yeah. our people who create movies for a living, but they're like, eh, you know, I and I know that they do that 18 hours a day. I know they're tired. I know that they mm-hmm. have big, important jobs. But the whole notion that you can just outsource democracy mm-hmm. to a bunch of amateurs like us. Mm-hmm. And hope that it works out because we're right and we should just be able to harangue people into agreeing with us is insane. And it's been proven wrong forever. But Drift, <laughs> you know? class, Drift class, I think there's another part to that. Yes. And the, the part of that is, um, and, and I'm saying this with a great deal of love because most of the people I work with live there. Yes. But here we are in the middle of the Midwest. California is a different planet. It is. I understand that. Yeah. And- California, apart from the stupid, stupid recall election that's mm-hmm. going on because Republicans in California have nothing else to do. True. Um, moving California to the left is, you know, it's something that everyone is working on <laughs> out right. there. Right. And it it makes me just shake my head because here we are between Missouri and Indiana Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> and we are the progressive beacon of the Midwest in I Illinois. Know. I know we're we going to are... talk about that, but seriously, we are. We just are. Yeah, and we're so regionally we are so spoiled, yeah. but nationally we're not. So I'm we're getting off track here. But if you're living in Hollywood, how you perceive what the political agenda for the country is is very different from if you live in Kansas. 
Well, and I want to expand that just a, an inch mm-hmm. by saying if you're living in L.A., D.C., mm-hmm. or or N.Y.C. Mm-hmm. Uh, and a few other places, mm-hmm. um, your perception of of what of who your listeners are, who your followers are, what mm-hmm. the agenda is, what it should be, what's practical, it's realistic, is radically different mm-hmm. than people mm-hmm. who I can see, you know, who are your friends and your your allies mm-hmm. who live in Missouri, Indiana, Illinois, Iowa, et cetera, the, the, the middle of the middle, middle of middle America, mm-hmm. which is mm-hmm. why the overwhelming majority of podcasts are located in LA, DC, and New York, mm-hmm. and they are entirely insular, almost a hundred percent insular. They mm-hmm. talk to each other, among each other, and they, they do valuable things. They get out the vote and they have important voices, but there's no sense that there's an entire continent out there that has to be moved along with you at least a little bit. Or else you're not going to get anything you want. And that is something that is maddening because there are plenty of liberal voices out here in the... We hear from them all the time. The blue dots in red states gravitate to our podcast because no one else is talking to them as if they exist. Right. You know what? We should just stop the podcast right there. Call it a wrap. (laughs) (laughs) That's a really, really good sentiment and I can't top it. And I'm an egomaniac who thinks I can top anything. (laughs) We but love you, blue dots and red states. We've we been there. We are I've, blue dots and red states. So all three of my children well, no, were born in true. Alabama. Not quite sure. <laughs> we, we are we are blue dots in a red region. Yeah. We still have this massive blue engine at the top of our state that mm-hmm. all the Republicans down here want to get rid of, called Chicago, mm-hmm. which is why we have a governor who's willing with fuck you money, who's willing to do amazing things that we're going to talk about in a few minutes. But first... We're going to talk about Joe Biden, who came to Illinois this he week. He did. And you know where he went? He didn't go to the blue enclaves. He went to goddamn Crystal Lake. Crystal Lake? Yeah. Tell us where Crystal Lake is. Crystal Lake is a uh, Republican enclave in the northern suburbs of Chicago. Mm-hmm. And he um, went to McHenry College. McHenry, yes. And right. he... and But here's the thing. Um, and I, I have wor- the working title of this little piece of our podcast is is entitled on this week's episode of why why won't Democrats talk about jobs? Um, <laughs> because on the conservative podcast, the Never Trump Anti Trump podcast I have listened to, there's just a constant bitching that Democrats are doing it all wrong. Mm-hmm. And one of the themes that they're just beating all the time is why won't Democrats talk about jobs? You spend all this money, get people jobs, you bring them back. You have the infrastructure bill. Why don't you put it in terms of jobs? And I know I talked about this a couple of weeks ago. I've written about it. It's called the American Jobs Act. That's and what Joe it's Biden called. Is, it's in and the Joe name. Biden is, and Joe Biden is going around the country talking about jobs and jobs and jobs and jobs and jobs. So I don't know. And the advertising on our television uh-huh. is all about jobs and green jobs and American jobs. So I just think at this point they're making shit up to get mad at Joe Biden mm-hmm. about. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, because they need to feel relevant. They need to feel that. If they weren't on our shoulder hectoring us to do, you know, their bidding, mm-hmm. that then we're going to lose it all. Because mm-hmm. the only people who really know how to win elections are the people who've lost their entire <laughs> fucking party, apparently. <laughs> so we should definitely listen to those guys because they're geniuses at holding onto a political party and making it work. Um, yeah, Joe Biden was visiting the Republican stronghold of Crystal Lake to talk about families and jobs. And he had two Democratic women with him. He did. He had Senator Tammy Duckworth. And Representative Lauren Underwood with him. And these two women who are clearly the future of the party. Right. And who sort of get to be the squad without taking all the shit from the right, the, the squad For gets all For some reason. Long. And yeah. I think it has to do with, as you say, location. Oh, yeah. You know, and not being Muslim. So that yep. the hate, the hate fire hose is not turned on Tammy Duckworth because, God damn it, she's a veteran who lost her legs in Iraq. She did. And... Uh, Lauren Underwood is at a, you know, she is from a Republican district. She flipped yes. her seat in 2018 and, held and it. kept it in 2020 yep. through constituent services. Absolutely. Constituent services. Absolutely. Yeah. Old yeah. fashioned politics. Um, now that is on one side of the ledger. Joe Biden, the the working title of this section uh, of our notes is called Twilight of Politicon or Why Joe Biden Doesn't Have to Cater to David Brooks Anymore. Yeah. And this is what came up in our lunch together yeah. today of just the fact that Joe Biden doesn't have to uh, pretend that both sides, you know, I need to do do all this coddling right. of right winger, right wing white men in order right. to succeed because he is a, a white man, right. an old white guy, 
And so he doesn't have to straddle the same fences that Barack Obama had to do. And he watched Barack Obama fail in some ways. Exactly. exactly. Because of it. And He's in not going to make those mistakes. In my theater of imagination, I have this imaginary interview between Joe Biden and David Brooks, where he asked David Brooks, how many times you've been to Scranton, Mr. Brooks? And, and <laughs> Is that which... only a Stella line? I don't think so. Yeah. Oh, really? Zero? <laughs> well, what kind of manufacturing job did your dad have? Well, my dad was a privileged guy who taught me. Okay, well, what public school did you go? Oh, I went to a very privileged. Well, what what trade did you learn to work with your hands? Well, I actually went and uh, majored in a, a, a community college. You know, I went to uh, major in history at University of Chicago. Oh, what job did you ever have in your fucking life where you got your hands dirty? Well, occasionally I spilled ink when I worked for the Weekly Standard talking about what assholes liberals are. Mm-hmm. And Joe Biden, I just think in his heart of hearts, has no respect for people like that. Yeah. Has no inkling, has no desire to be part of it. He, It's not quite the same, but it's similar to Johnson and Kennedy. Mm-hmm. In the mm-hmm. sense that Johnson comes in with a completely different perspective yep. on politics than Kennedy. Kennedy is very comfortable hanging out with with Ben Bradley. Mm-hmm. He's very comfortable you're rubbing elbows with elites and 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 listening to the to the chattering classes of his day. And Johnson has just isn't interested in that at all. And it's not the same, but it's similar because Biden doesn't have, I think, any respect for people who've never worked for a living. Right. Johnson he, shared a fence with some genuinely poor people in yes, his life. He knows poor, he, he grew he knows up poor poverty. And he knows poverty. Yeah. And the people that run our control the media agenda, control the conversation, are people who are incredibly privileged, mm-hmm. who rarely leave their bubble, and who always tell the same fucking fairy tale that that two Democratic administrations in a row and two Republican administrations in a row have proven to be completely fucking wrong. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. and and this was extremely well highlighted by the fact that while Joe Biden is on stage with Tammy Duckworth and Lauren Underwood, um, Republican Senate leader Mitch McConnell was complaining that his state of Kentucky was getting federal funds under the Recovery Act, which he was bragging that no Republican voted for. So fuck and you. And he was in Kentucky when he was talking yeah. about this. So you know, there's, there's money coming, I guess. And I guess you're going to get some of it. But fuck you. I didn't vote for it, which is a really fascinating strategy. It was I, a weird speech. Yeah. I it, I don't know exactly who he thought he was talking to. Well, I'm sure he's talking to the libertarians. Yeah. And, yeah. and the people who think uh, um, Ron Paul and Rand Paul are geniuses because all mm-hmm. money, all, all government is bad. But it was, it was he was extremely resentful mm-hmm. that Kentucky was getting recovery money to recover from a pandemic. And he was very proud of the fact that he didn't vote for it and none of the Republicans voted for it. Meanwhile, Republican Representative Chip Roy was from on the Texas. record. From Texas. From the great state <laughs> of Texas. was on the record this week saying 18 more months of chaos and the inability to get stuff done. That's what we want. That's what we want. So there is no clearer contrast than Republicans – saying, fuck, how how can we trash the money we already got? And how can we stop an infrastructure bill that we desperately need from passing just because we're obstructive assholes versus Biden and Duckworth and Underwood standing on a stage together talking about families and health care and, and child care and jobs. And it was just so clear that there are two completely different universes clashing in this country. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what, I I guess McConnell's right. I mean, his his calculation is that the Republican Party base are, in fact, reprogrammable meatbags who just don't notice or care about anything except, I don't know, critical race theory and and, and the the LGBT agenda or something. Um, I think Democrats running for Congress need to get water testing kits. Yeah. And just walk around their district and hand them out and say, go see if there's lead in your water. Yeah. Because well, at this point, that's what they're, they don't want anything to get done about lead in children's water. Yeah. Well, you might remember, this is different but similar. When Barack Obama was saying, look, get a, get a tire gauge, mm-hmm, <laughs> make sure mm-hmm. your tires are fully inflated. You can save gas that way and we can, we can not burn as much gas. I was like, oh, that fucking weirdo who wants you to – who the hell? And they're, they're holding up tire gauges. I remember right. Newt Gingrich had a whole thing about that. Like, what the hell's wrong with you people? Yeah. This is the kind of advice that dads would give their kids. Absolutely. You know? And But Barack Obama saying, here's a simple thing you can do. Oh, my God. Can you believe this commie bastard yeah. telling me to check my tires? Telling kids to stay in school and yeah. work hard. Yeah. Um, and just in case Chip Roy was worried – 
that people didn't get the message a week later when he was asked about it. I'm sorry, later this week, uh, he said he plans to, quote, oppose almost everything that Congress does and fight with every ounce of my being to stop the radical left and weak Republicans. Then he added, for the next 18 months, Republicans' jobs to do everything we can do to slow down and block the Democrats' radical agenda and then win the majority and lead. Well, yeah, wreck the country and turn it into a fascist shithole. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and really blocking child care, health care, infrastructure, and jobs is, mm-hmm. is a Republican's idea of winning. Right. And, and right. It, it, it doesn't surprise me because this is who they are. But what I found interesting, and this is where you and I talked about the past in history, is mm-hmm. this is shaping up to be an even more vicious replay of the fights from the early 90s that led to the passage of the welfare to work legislation. Ah, because the success that welfare to work had was due entirely or almost entirely to the enormous labor shortage of the early 90s. Oh, that's People, similar to what we're dealing with today. We had a, we had a big jobs. We had a big uh, uh, boom. People were the 20 million new jobs. And suddenly employers, especially in the in the retail and hospitality industries, were desperate for employees. So they would they would try pretty much anything very similar to what we're having now. And Clinton at the time faced a hostile Republican House under Gingrich and a GOP that made it very clear that their agenda was to kick everyone off of everything. They wanted to shut down social programs. They wanted to punish people for being poor. And Clinton rejected the first six offers from the GOP, which were all horrible, but knew he'd have to pass something. So he held out for a very robust support system that would allow people on welfare who were mostly single mothers Mm -hmm. to be successful in the workforce by providing them with wraparound services that provided childcare and transportation and government funded training and a whole bunch of other services, all of which employers were good with because they needed the workers. Mm -hmm. It was Mm -hmm. an equitable, it was a virtuous cycle where employers who were largely conservative were completely cool with this because it would get them what they needed. It It trained workforce. Right. And the reason I know this in like excruciating detail is my ex was one of the people that wrote the white paper for welfare to work for the city of Chicago. Mm-hmm. And I went to work for the city of Chicago at the peak of welfare to work stuff. when In workforce development. In workforce development. When people were being trained, you know, people were demanding ESL programs be brought mm-hmm. to their restaurant because they had, you know, a huge restaurant. Their workforce was entirely or almost entirely Hispanic and they needed them to speak English. Well, that's great. You're going to promote people and give them a better life and move them up through the ranks. And we're going to provide you with training that gets them linguistically able to adapt to your environment. That's terrific. And the thing that struck me so hard is we now have very similar circumstances. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, And Joe Biden was up on stage talking about all of that shit, exactly the stuff that Clinton held out for. But this time we have a president who was present during those fights and he learned from them. Mm -hmm. So from Clinton, Biden learns that if you want people to work, sometimes they're going to need government help, sometimes a lot of government help. And from watching Obama get burned over and over again, Biden learned that there's no point in trying to cater to the fucking pundit class. Right. Now, you had an article, you read this to me as we were talking about this, from Donnie Deutsch. Donnie Deutsch. From multi, multi, multi multi-millionaire, billionaire, business owner, former business owner Donnie Deutsch, bitching about why why people don't want to work. They don't want to go back to work. Yeah. And there's the great resignation and, and people not wanting to go back to their jobs. And if I still owned a company, yeah. says Donnie Deutsch from his home <laughs> from his- to Morning Joe, yeah. where he's at home, if I still owned a company, I would make everyone come back to the office. Yeah. He says from his home. From his luxury Where he does Manhattan not own a company. Condo. He's not running a company anymore. Yeah. yeah. Why are you still running a company? Don't you care about America, Donnie Deutsch? Yeah. You just don't want to work, do you? Yeah. And He's, as someone on Twitter said, he literally produces hot air yeah, for a living. Yeah, all he does. What he does for a living is make farting noises Mm-hmm. On MSNBC right. for a living because he's friends for his with his buddy Scarborough. Joe Scarborough. Yeah, yeah that's, that's it. it. And he's sitting there lecturing people uh, uh, lecturing. about not reopening because he probably has some business interest in the New York commercial real estate office space sector. Yeah, well, I'm sure he does. <laughs> I'm sure but, he's very, or some of his friends are very nervous about commercial office space sector in New York City. 
Well, yeah. and, and there's just an awful lot of extremely wealthy, privileged um, uh, shut-ins. Yeah. Uh, who have a lot of really um, uh, spicy opinions <laughs> about what poor people think and do and want yeah. and how they should be treated, which is exactly the same arguments that were going on in the 90s. Yeah. yeah. This was, you know, Gingrich wanted to punish poor people. He wanted them kicked off welfare. And, and you see this as a trend from Republicans going way, way, way back. You know, the Ronald Reagan and welfare queens. It was always blame the poor, always blame the poor. And and the the solution to the problem of poverty is more jobs, better jobs for people that can work them and support systems that make it possible. If you want women to enter the workforce or re-enter the workforce in large numbers who have families, you would damn well better provide them with childcare. Yeah. And you yeah. damn well better provide them with pre-K and kindergarten and, and after school care and after yes. school care right. which is which is what as clinton used to say just a smart investment in the future mm-hmm. of the country yep that's just why that's a dollar spent and 10 dollars in return absolutely why is this, and but but that's when you run up against the 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 deeply christian morality of the right that poor people are immoral monsters who need to be mm-hmm. kicked harder and the only way they're ever going to go back to work is if they're punished and and if they don't go back Voluntarily need to kick them harder and harder and harder until they go to jail, maybe. Then we'll put them in prison. But it is that sick conservative mentality that manifests itself in we need to obstruct the government to stop it from doing good things, or people will start thinking government can do good things and then punish poor people for being poor and make them even more miserable than they already are because then they'll be motivated to go out and get a shitty job Mm -hmm. and not raise their children so we can put the kid in jail. And that entire system, um, must now be flushed down the toilet. Mm-hmm. That entire mm-hmm. mindset. Now, I don't think I'll live to see it, but it is it is that whole universe has to go. Mm-hmm. And we need to find a better way of of digging under it and digging over it and crushing it. Now, one small suggestion I have is what we really need is a sweeping retraining program called Wing Nut Welfare to Work. <laughs> Um, <laughs> Wing nut welfare yeah. to actual work. To actual work. Uh, <laughs> because from what I hear on the conservative and never Trumper and anti-Trumper podcast that I listen to, years of living off of the wing nut welfare dole has really rotted their brains. Mm-hmm. Um, for example, I have been listening to Joe Walsh's podcast, you know, Deadbeat oh, Joe, Shabby Cracker Joe, because I want to give it a fair listen. Because Joe, I was joking about the how shitty his podcast is. Um, and the saddest story I heard was when he was on the Charlie Sykes podcast complaining about how he got fired from his radio job. And Charlie Sykes says, well, you really should take up podcasting. And uh, this was, I'm sorry, this was all over Twitter. And mm-hmm. it was a back and forth between them. And nobody told Charlie Sykes that, that uh, Joe Walsh has been podcasting for a couple of years now. It's just yeah. nobody listens because he's not part <laughs> of the Bulwark Network, Charlie. <laughs> Bring him on board. Um, but I was reminded listening to Joe Walsh. Uh, of the apocryphal story of the man who had a make-work job polishing the brass cannon in the town square. And then after years of saving up his money, he bought his own brass cannon and tried to go into business for himself. And Joe Walsh lost sight of the fact that the only reason he had money in his pocket is because he was willing to go on Fox News and call people like you and me communists and scum. Mm -hmm. That's the only reason anybody ever paid him a fucking nickel. And the minute he said, well, maybe I should stop doing that, the money ran out. Yeah. And his entire training program for how to talk is <laughs> terrible. It's just fucking, it's I don't know who told him it sounds wonderful for him to talk that way. It's. With really long pauses in between. Like, like you broke a microphone. Yeah. And I'm, I'm fiddling with my volume control. And it starts off with the most infantile repetition of Republicans are assholes. Did you know that they're assholes? They're such assholes. And they're they're cruel and they're assholes. And they're they're coming for democracy. And it's this sort of like, okay, yeah, we all knew that. What new are you bringing to the conversation? What, what you're bringing to the conversation are two-minute pauses during which <laughs> nobody knows what's going on. Because you're used to shouting at an audience who – this is like his pause for applause moment. Yeah. That yeah. somebody told him, you don't, you're not getting applause anymore, so just keep talking. But it's the most reductive – infantile, stupid, oh, Republicans are bad for 40 minutes. And mm-hmm. then, of course, interspersed with complaints about losing his job on Fox News. 
you know, there's no, they took my radio show away from me and Fox News won't hire me no more. Well, of course not. They are a crack house. Mm -hmm. You decided that the crack was bad. <laughs> the crack dealers and the crack makers and the crack distributors all said, well, uh, sorry, Joe, what we make here is crack. So there's the exit. And now you're on the outside going, but the crack dealer won't pay me no more. Mm -hmm. So, and that's his whole podcast. That's it. And yet, <laughs> as you and I were having that conversation about how should we talk about Joe Walsh? Should we even talk about Joe Walsh? Mm -hmm. You said, oh, mm -hmm. by the way, he was on CNN this morning. He was on CNN of this fucking morning. fucking course he was. Saying nothing. Fucking of course. Just filling five minutes yeah. during vacation week. Yeah. Because the bookers got him <laughs> on the phone and he's in their Rolodex. Yep. So I ran screaming from the room and turned on MSNBC where Charlie Sykes was telling me all about election law. <laughs> uh -huh. I thought, okay. All right. Yeah. I get it. I get it. You don't need to hit me over the head one more time. But it really is a matter of they have never had to operate think on their feet and operate in, a, in any environment that required them to be accountable or take a punch and then give a punch. They're so used to a completely contained system where nobody ever pushes back on them that when they're forced outside of that, they they have no idea what to do. They have no well, idea how but, to talk. But Drift Glass, and I hate to bring up his name, but David Brooks knows what to do. Yes, he does. He, he's rebuilding the both cider temple. He is. I, I, I wrote about it this week. Uh, yeah, it, it, you can. And we're going to refer everyone to driftglass.blogspot.com yeah, and read but it. <laughs> he's right back to the business of being David Brooks. It's both it's sides conjoining yep. a, some students at elite colleges and I guess critical race theory. And Donald Trump and the entire Republican Party are so co-equally bad and toxic that he puts them in the same paragraph. Uh -huh. And then he denounces progressives, the conservatives, are tearing the country apart. Like there's, there's just no stopping it. Mm -hmm. And there's no one at the Washington or sorry, New York Times who's going to intervene and say, you know what, David, it's time for you to go <laughs> enjoy mm -hmm. a life somewhere other than putting words together. But again, it is a, it is the result of never having been challenged on anything. Mm -hmm. Never having mm -hmm. anyone around who would push his back. Never having an editor who would take a red pencil to a single fucking word he says. Mm -hmm. um, I remember um, uh, some interaction he had when he – no, that's right. When he first went to the New York Times and he he wrote a post, an article about – this is – I was shocked. I, the first time I, I was hated on a mass scale because his comment section is filled up with people like me going – you have no fucking – this was during you know the Bush administration. He was an Iraq mm -hmm. war guy and he and he didn't know how to cope with the fact that he was suddenly in, in a much bigger venue. Also didn't know how to cope with the fact that he'd just been completely wrong. Right. He spent the Bush administration being wrong and people were calling him out on it. And that was like something you just don't do. And he reacted by lying about it and pretending it didn't happen and moving on. He didn't on. write it. I didn't no, write I it. I didn't that. say I those things. It. I never and, wrote and that. And never talking yeah. about it. Yeah. And the, the, the collusion – at that level of the American media is that, and no one else will call you out on it either. And that is the greatest mystery to me. Yeah. Which is what does he have on everyone in mainstream media that think, no, virtually no one, very, with very few exceptions, no one at that level of publications will say he's a bullshit artist. And well, I don't know. They've got, he's got something on someone. I, I, or he's I just all guilted them into thinking that he's a frail flower who can't handle it. I, I think and you'll deeply hurt me if you say mean thing. I, I think it's much more of a mutual protection league mm. where they're all bullshitting all the time. Yeah. And if we start yeah. calling each other out on what we wrote yesterday and the day before, suddenly Matthew Dowd's unemployed and Joe Scarborough's yeah. unemployed and yeah. Mika Brzezinski doesn't have a sugar daddy anymore. And suddenly the, the seats are empty and who's going to go on the air and tell people that everything's fine. Both sides do it. Mm -hmm. um, there's, there, there is such a codependent protective shell where they all tell the same story mm -hmm. and they all mm -hmm. stick to the same mainstream media lie. And he's just better at it than everybody or he leads the way. But it is clear that he that there's he doesn't understand any language. He is incapable of functioning outside of a both sides do it ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And that is a very um, fertile system. It's still well, up and running. And you just and fine. I talked about at lunch, we were talking about the twilight of Politicon, the fact yes. that all of these folks have to f now find a way to make a living that that involves a totally new landscape where the Republican Party is Trumpus. Yes, yes. And you can't say, well, there's reasonable Republicans and Democrats that need to form a coalition so that we have a say 
we're going to come up. It, it is the little red hen. You put it so well years and years ago. 16 years right? ago, yeah. Right. Well, the Democratic Party has an infrastructure bill. They have they have a yeah. plan for the future of this country, which inc- is inclusive and takes care of children and is, you know, it's a plan. They have a plan for health care, et cetera. Yeah. So were you listening to- The Republican Party has Donald Trump screaming and crying about a stolen election that is a lie. So you were listening to me talk about Joe Trippi's inaugural podcast, right? <laughs> uh, on the Lincoln Project? Yeah, I on did that Lincoln to myself On the Lincoln Project today. podcast, they've yeah. got a Democrat on, another they, Democrat on board. They hired Joe Trippi to front as a Democrat, to make it, you know, bipartisan. Yeah. Um, and he's now a senior advisor. And I listened for about halfway through and I just couldn't anymore because it was- it was, it was all very – it wasn't yelling, it wasn't shouting, but it was so much ahistoric revisionist bullshit mm-hmm. um, that, you know, all about how, you know, because Republicans are such monsters, you know, top to bottom, left to right, completely, the party's fucked up. We need to form some sort of coalition, uh, a pro-democracy coalition. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, dude, the Democratic Party is what you're talking about. But he can't say that because – Telling these people to join the Democratic Party is not how you get to be a senior advisor at the Lincoln Project. <laughs> so you have to make it about, no, all of us need to be in a big cause. Yeah, it's called the Democratic Party. It's called the Democratic Party. And no, you need no. to work to pass the infrastructure bill. But all that money, trillions of dollars, we can't do that. Yeah, well. You need to keep my tax cuts in place. Well, that they never mention that. that no. Nothing to do with them. But, but he does say that he needs to form, they need to form, they need to lead the way in forming this cross party coalition with Democrats and Republicans and independents. Like who the fuck is still a Republican that you want on your team? Right. And but what you see, they spent, <coughs> they spent most of their career mm-hmm. being in that world where you could have, uh, Ann Coulter at Politicon oh, as yes. a colleague. Absolutely. Yep. 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 And so now that's gone because the only way you can do that is you have to go to a Trump rally to, yeah. to reach, that contingent of the the Ann Coulter contingent of the party is at a Trump rally now. Yeah, that, and the Ann Coulter contingent is the party. Is the party. Yeah. Well, and I got to say the funniest thing of mm-hmm. all the, the nonsense I heard him talking on this thing was Joe Trippi pining for the good old days just before Trump when political operatives on both sides of the aisle fought hard but respected each other and behaved very civilly towards the other side. I just wanted to intervene for a second and say, hey, Joe, Rick Wilson is sitting right there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Would you like me to read you some of the quotes, some of the tweets, some of his some of ads? His tweets are kind of nasty. Are really fucking <laughs> racist and nasty and horrible. And no, you these fuckers were never civil. These people made a living shitting on everything you believe in, Joe. And maybe you honestly think that this is the way forward. I don't know. But it is hilarious to me. That you are buying into all of the bullshit about, you know, we need to put all of our differences behind us. Let's not talk about the bad. You know, remember the good old days when we all used to get along and we all used to buy drinks and nobody was mad at each other? No, those days didn't exist, Joe. Let me show you the tweets to prove it. Well, that's why you get blocked on Twitter, Drift Glass. So, <laughs> anyway, you, I, and, and in the good news department, I would like to hear more about this J.B. Pritzker fellow who's your governor. Oh, you would? Yeah. Well, I'll talk about that um, right now. Okay. If you don't mind. Please. Uh, Illinois has expanded Medicaid again, Drift Glass, and I'm so excited about that. Me there too. is yeah. so much going on in Illinois right now that is good. Um, yet this week, J.B. Pritzker, our governor, signed a bill, which he called a bipartisan bill, which, again, I find that hilarious because Republicans in the Illinois State House have to work on constituent services and making sure that their constituents get something from state government. Because they're never going to be in house leadership ever. So if they wanted to do something, they have to accomplish something. They have to work with Democrats on it. And so th- they get one or two Republicans to serve on this Medicaid spending committee. And then J.B. Prisker goes out and says, this is bipartisan, right? It's going to be like the January 6th commission with Liz Cheney on it, right? It's bipartisan. Great. But he has expanded Medicaid. Um in a whole lot of very specific ways, giving funding to veteran services, getting getting funding to um, medication for kidney transplant people, mm-hmm. regardless of immigration status. Yep. Um, it's a very progressive law that got signed this week. And one of the things that I personally found out about 
through my interaction with the Medicaid people this week, um, I had been very concerned about middle child and her insurance because my kids, like most children in Illinois, are on Medicaid. Thank you, Hillary Clinton. Mm -hmm. She, back when she was first lady, you know, she didn't get a Hillary care passed. So they switched gears and worked on basically an all kid, what they call it all kids in Illinois, but whatever the, your state calls it, getting children covered. Right. Chip. And chip. And getting children and pregnant mothers covered. And that is a sop to the um, anti-abortion people, by the way, mm -hmm. that no one can make the excuse, I can't afford to have the, the medical care to have a baby because the minute you're pregnant, if you're uninsured, you're on Medicaid. Um, but- I was concerned because middle child turned 19 this month. Mm -hmm. And I remember when junior dude turned 19, I got a letter saying he's aging out of Medicaid and you need to find something else. And, you know, we did. We found for while he was in college, the cheapest option for me was to let his father pay for insurance through his college. Mm -hmm. um, middle child. I didn't I hadn't gotten the letter and I didn't know what was going on. And I was very concerned that she was going to be uninsured going into college this fall. Mm -hmm. And that, that, you know, that because of COVID, they hadn't sent the letters out or something and she was going to be up a creek. So I called and I was very, you know, I'm honest. I said my child turned 19. I need to know, is she what are you doing? Are you sending me a letter so I can? And by the way, if you're going to get uh Obamacare, if you're going to go through the Affordable Care Act and the exchange, you need to have that letter. You have right. to prove that your child is aged out of Medicaid. That's right. Mm -hmm. And so I needed that letter to get her on our Obamacare if that's what she needed to do. And so I called and the person very quickly said, no, no, no. The governor's state of emergency under COVID is still in effect and he's not kicking anyone off of Medicaid. You turn 19, you're still on Medicaid. You, mm -hmm. you do whatever. The, the, we're, not, we're not kicking anyone off. They're also, um, as of last summer, uh, there's a certain, um, so people that are very poor get Medicaid for free. Mm -hmm. If you reach a certain level of the federal poverty level, you pay $20 a month per kid. Or if you get at a higher level, you pay $40 months, dollars a month per kid, and that's the max. Otherwise, mm -hmm. you, your income's too high. Mm -hmm. So um, they stopped charging everybody. They said right. no, no premiums, no copays because we're we're in COVID. We're we're just we want people to take their kids to the doctor if they've got a respiratory illness. We don't want them to have to pay a copay because they might be out of work. No copays, no copays, no premiums. Everybody's free, and that's for the duration. This law that was signed this week by JB Prisker extends that emergency to whenever he says it's over, <laughs> which is, hey, JB, <laughs> this is a governor, this is a progressive governor has got fuck you money, by the way. Right. We've said that's, that before. That's right? important. He's Very a multimillionaire himself. Mm -hmm. um, I really am beginning to think this is the best of all possible worlds, but because yeah. he's truly progressive, he's really like trying to help families and he wants this state. He wants Illinois, as he said this week. I want Illinois to be the number one place for raising a family. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that's a, that's a California mindset here in the Midwest. That really right. is. He's, he wants daycare. He wants college. He wants healthcare, healthcare for healthcare. everybody, Educate. anybody. Yeah. Universal access to healthcare. Community college, the whole um, thing. Yeah. Yeah. And the fact he's, you know, he's, he's finding places in re in roads to how can we provide medications and services to, uh, undocumented immigrants. And so he's finding these little places where Republicans will agree to that, like kidney transplant medicines right. <laughs> was one in this bill. You know, mm -hmm. regardless of your immigration status, Medicaid will pay for your medications. So um, he, but th this bill that he signed this week extends the uh, Medicaid access to everyone who went on Medicaid during the pandemic up until the point that he declares the emergency over mm -hmm. plus one year. Yeah. <laughs> plus so one that year. no one is stranded. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Right? So right. that when, when we get to the point where, yes, COVID is over, we're okay. Mm -hmm. No one is stranded by that. 
Right. And it gives people time to adjust and say, yeah, I've got time. Yeah. And so we're figuring junior year of college for middle child, we might have to start thinking about right. whether she needs insurance or not from school or from Obamacare, wherever we decide to get it. But what a sigh of relief for us and for everyone who's yeah. who's at this point. I mean, you and I have been, you know, our income, f- what it is, <laughs> has been stable during the pandemic. Right. Um, a lot of people's aren't. No. It's, it's been, it's been and, hit and miss. It's been dropped off a cliff. You know, there's. And if your state didn't expand Medicaid and you're, you lose your job and you're just in this state where you can't, right. you know, poor working adults without kids can't just go on Medicaid, you're screwed. Yeah. And you know and what it makes is, you. It is a question of the state you live in and that's not fair. And you know what makes you feel better if you've suddenly found yourself adrift on, on a collapsing economy during a pandemic? Um, is your senator standing up and saying, yeah, I didn't vote for any of this shit. You take it if you want, but fuck you, you're not getting any more. <laughs> you're getting billions of dollars, but you know, none of my party voted yeah, for it. Yeah. yeah. And you better spend it wisely because I'm not doing this ever again. You got this yeah, one. We're never yeah. going to let this happen again. Yeah. Oh, great. Yeah. And you got to wonder, uh, you know, anyway, go ahead. I also wanted to highlight something that uh, is in the QAnon world. Yeah. Apparently QAnon is trying to rebrand themselves as being you know, pro-education. And what they mean is pro-white nationalist education. Yeah. This whole critical race theory has really taken off. This bullshit. And uh, it's proof positive that QAnon is the Tea Party. Yep. That's all it is. It's a rebranding of conservative voters into something weird and uh, cult and team-oriented. And they're running for school board. Yeah. They're finding people to run for school board. Mm-hmm. If, some, if you see someone in your community running for school board, I'm sorry that you have to pay attention to the school board elections, but you do. And it's really important to out them and out the, who's funding their campaigns. Yep. Yep. Find out where the money's coming from because this has got to stop. This beating up of teachers because the next thing is they're going to fire teachers who teach equality in the classroom. Right. And and here comes banning to kill a mockingbird. Right. And here comes Well, the and whole... they're banning that we we talked about it in our news roundup. They're they're banning the book that was written by Ruby Bridges about desegregating schools because white people aren't happy at the end and and redeemed. Well, of course yeah. they're not redeemed. They voted for George Wallace after that. Well, and and I I think that there's no word on whether or not they're banning cable TV in Kentucky because they run Lincoln almost every day on some cable channel. And that <laughs> <laughs> that does not have a happy ending for those sorts of people either. No. They lost no. a whole war. They lost their own country. That's a real You're shame. Right about yep. Hey, Drift Glass, let's do a news roundup. Okay. Um, after you, darling. Eric Prince wants to use $10 billion of you know Betsy DeVos money, I guess, to make himself the warlord of a private mercenary army in the Ukraine. Yay! That's exactly... We need... We need more of that. The America's We're not made, taxing enough in this country. No. And We're our major, putting people in prison that should be. <laughs> our major export is about to become mercenaries. Yeah. Um, and Richard Branson is not going to space. He is going up in a thing. But I wanted to stress the point that the official NASA threshold for space is 62 miles above the Earth's surface. That's the lowest point at which you've entered space. Branson's surrogate penis rocket We'll make it to about 55 <laughs> miles, which means that he's not going up in space. What he's doing is going up in an airplane that goes up very high and gives his passengers a few minutes of free fall, not zero G, but free fall on the way down. That's it. That's all he's doing. And we are. I'm glad you cleared that up, Drift. Yeah, well, and we are grossly <laughs> undertaxed in this country. Grossly <laughs> undertaxed. In good news, the Democratic National Committee is spending $25 million on get out the vote efforts, the, yeah. a new $25 million. They're yeah. redoubling their efforts uh, across the country. We have to do that. It's it's hand-to-hand combat yep. in, in our the 2022 election. Yeah. And speaking of the 2022 elections, uh, they should be lit, as my wife tells me every now and Absolutely. then, uh, because the, the insurrection trial should begin to really take off just about the same time as the 2022 midterms heat up. Yep. And those trials are going to be lit and those Republican primaries are going to be lit. They are. And uh, I, I'm really looking forward to the crazy amping up in those Republican primaries. And then we don't forget in the general what they said. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
This week, Donald Trump announced a class action lawsuit against Twitter and Facebook, which prompted Alan Dershowitz to pronounce this the most important First Amendment trial of the 21st century. I don't care what Alan Dershowitz is. Well. But it did cause virtually every lawyer to was, laugh at Alan Dershowitz until it hurts. Yeah. Every lawyer <laughs> on earth who was not Alan Dershowitz thought, really, just, oh, yeah. really, go away, please, for God's sake. Uh, Joe Biden ever heard of him, endorsed major changes to the military justice system that would remove investigating and prosecuting sexual assault cases from the chain of command. The military justice system would instead hand sexual harassment and assault cases off to independent military lawyers, which is incredibly important. I want to uh, express solidarity with the Frito-Lay strike in Kansas. Yeah. Uh, There are uh, strikers striking a Frito Lay plant there, and uh, they're being forced to serve these things called suicide shifts, where you work for twelve hours and then get eight hours off and have to be back at work again. Uh huh. And uh, they've had something like a twenty cent raise in the past nine years, twenty to forty cents. Um, it's terrible, and the reason that it's terrible is that the state of Kansas and their labor laws have let Frito Lay get away with this. And uh, that's Republicans, folks. Or as Donnie Deutsch would say, they just don't want to work. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, speaking of jobs, the U.S. economy a- added 850,000 jobs in June, which is the largest number of jobs added in a single month since August. Joe Biden responded to the June jobs numbers, saying the American Rescue Plan relief bill was, quote, provi- uh, proving the naysayers and doubters that they were wrong. Proving to whom, Drift Glass? Yeah, that's a that's always my question. <laughs> that the passive yeah. voice always makes me wonder who does this need to be shown, exposed, or proved to? Trump told his chief of staff in 2018 that Hitler did a lot of good things, according to a new book by Michael Bender. The remark shocked John Kelly, but not so shocked that he would actually out Donald Trump as a Hitler lover. Right, or say or do anything about it. No. Yeah. Detailing the former president's, quote, stunning disregard for history. Yeah. Um, Representative Mo Brooks has a unique defense saying that he can't be sued for inciting the Capitol riot because he is a federal employee. Apparently inciting riots is part of his job description. I see. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And Republican Senator Ron Johnson mouthed that climate change is bullshit during a Republican luncheon. Yeah. Uh, The U.S. military has left the Bagram airfield in Afghanistan after nearly 20 years. The base was the center of U.S. military counterterrorism campaign in Afghanistan, with fighter jets, drones, and cargo planes taking off from the twin runways night and day. The airfield was handed over to the Afghan National Security and Defense Force, effectively ending America's longest foreign war. The U.S., however, will continue to pay nearly $4 billion annually until 2024, to finance the Afghan security forces. And honestly, I have a, I have the same question I had about Iraq, and it's an unfair question, and I'm, I'm ignorant of the answer, so bear with me. During the Iraq war, George Bush kept bragging about how fast the Afghan military and police were being trained by Americans. Mm-hmm. And I did the math. It's like, so over the course of four years, you've trained literally every person in the country. Mm-hmm. Why mm-hmm. do we need to stay there? <laughs> Um, We've been in Afghanistan for a generation, Mm -hmm. and yet the minute we leave, I am told the country will simply collapse in on itself. It cannot be governed. They are incapable of defending themselves against the Taliban, and it's going to be – which might be true, but I don't get it. I don't understand how we can pour – billions of dollars and a generation of of young men and women into an into a single country and walk away and go well you know they are they cannot govern themselves there's something about the culture there's something about the geography something about the airspace i don't know what it is they they simply cannot govern their own country so you know best of luck and so long and this might be true i mean i'm sure that's what the russians learned after their years there mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. that is just and i'm not saying that angrily i'm saying that genuinely confused if if you spent the kind of money <laughs> on illinois for 20 mm-hmm. years that we spent in afghanistan illinois would be a paradise and we would be able to govern ourselves i'm pretty sure about that um but that's just me speaking from my ignorance as a midwesterner who doesn't understand foreign policy well i think 
a lot of it is geography and a lot of it is that it's not really a country. Right. Yeah. I, I think you're right about that. And it's, I think and it's, it's, it's so diverse in terms of geography and culture and powerful neighbors groups and, of people. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. It's not a country in the way that we see Canada. Well, and, <laughs> you know? and this, this is probably another lesson of this is why getting involved, getting entangled in other yeah. countries' business Mm-hmm. Is is just generally a terrible idea because right. we don't know what we're doing. If, right. If well, it's had, like relocating people in Vietnam. Right. And not even having the inkling that people could not leave the place where their forefathers were buried. Mm-hmm. That no other place would be home for them because culturally you are abandoning the bodies and the the graves of your ancestors. You mm-hmm. you absolutely cannot do that. You'll, you will not be home until you're back at on that particular plot of land. Now, if, and we didn't get it. We thought, no, oh, you can just move people. Yeah, no, you can't. We do here, right? We just pick Culturally, up Culturally, you can't do it. And it's the same thing anywhere else where we just go and think, oh, we can just invade and take over and well, train and it, people to be American soldiers. And, no, and if, and it doesn't this, work that way. And, yeah. and if this is the case, and I'm, I'm sure smarter people than me are telling me it is, I will. I would be happy to spend any amount of money necessary to get all of our allies and friends out of there. Mm-hmm. Anyone who helped us, anyone who feels endangered, relocate them to Kansas and Texas. There's plenty mm-hmm. of room there, and they could use some some people who are actually loyal to America. I suppose. Right there, you go. Fifty six percent of Americans say ensuring access to voting is more important than tamping down on voter fraud. Among Democrats, eighty five percent said voting access was more important while 72% of Republicans said making sure no one votes who isn't eligible was more important. Yeah. yeah. We, we, can't, we can't talk to each other anymore. Mm-mm. It's just, it's a lost cause. Uh, speaking of which, in a six to three ruling along ideological lines, the Supreme Court's conservative justices upheld two Arizona voting restrictions and pretty much gutted Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, which is the landmark 1965 civil rights law. This is from Elena Kagan's dissent. What is tragic here is that the court has yet again rewritten in order to weaken a statute that stands as a monument to American greatness and protects it against its basis impulses. Kagan also took a direct shot at Chief Justice John Roberts, who began the conservative court's all-out assault on voting rights uh, with the 2013 Shelby County decision. Kagan wrote, maybe some think that vote suppression is a relic of history, And so the need for a potent Section 2 has come and gone. Efforts to suppress the minority vote continue. No one would know this from reading the majority opinion. And in local news, the hot item Thursday morning was a survey to find out what viewers think of this. Heinz has started a petition to get hot dogs and buns sold in equal packs. The company says since hot dogs come in packs of 10 and the buns come in packs of 8, they say it should be equal. For this, Americans fought and died in two world wars. <laughs> yeah. Also, everybody knows that you take the two extra hot dogs and slice them up and put them in baked beans for beanie weenie. Beanie weenie. Every, everyone That's knows what this. you do. This is you how you tell. Weenie. This is how you tell <laughs> if someone is, a, is an American. It's an American test. Did, if you did not know that, you are obviously a foreign national or foreign spy. It has spy. been years since I served my children beanie weenies. Yeah. But- that was a staple when oh, yeah. we when you know, in 2008, 2009, when I didn't have a job and we were on food stands, Beanie Weenies was yeah. dinner. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, I, I, I have memories. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Each week we post to our Facebook page and website. Oh, by the way, I'm sorry. Yeah. One other thing I want to thank everybody who thought of me this week as I had my root canal. Yes. The, the most painful thing was the bill. <laughs> so... <laughs> Uh, and and I'm I'm grateful for the kind words and thoughts and so forth. Appreciate you mm-hmm. and uh, appreciate your support of our podcast. Because down the road, as as I pay that off, I'll be thinking of you back as as you support us. Appreciate it very much. Each week, we post to our Facebook page and website an Internet Kitty sent in by you, the listeners. This week's Internet Kitty is Harry Houdini. Harry Houdini is so named because he gets into rooms he's not supposed to be in. Sure. He can also appear as if by magic on the top of a door or curtain rod. We have a cat like that, too. We do, yeah. And, of course, Harry Houdini eats freshly poured cat food, our fake sponsor. 
Whether you serve pet store perfection or dollar store dreck, your cats will sit on the kitchen floor and demand that the food they eat is only freshly poured. Freshly poured, freshly poured. Oh my lord, it's freshly poured. You can visit Harry Houdini. He's on top of the curtains. Oh no! At our Facebook page or website. And you can send your internet kitty, dog, or other pet to us at our email address, proleftpodcast at gmail.com, where you can also write to both of us. Feel free to write us. We love hearing from you. Be aware that if you write us at any of our addresses, we reserve the right to read your email or U.S. Postal Service. Go Postal Unions! Letter on the air unless you say otherwise. Hashtag jail de joy. Don't forget our gourmet coffee guideline. If you can afford to buy an espresso-based beverage for yourself, especially if it's iced these days, yeah. buy one for us. This is not charity. This is our job, and it's a labor of love. Approximately 1% of our listeners support this podcast with a contribution. You can, too, see our website, proleftpod.com, for details. Our PayPal postal address information, it's all there at proleftpod.com. Please share our show on social media, and thank you so much for doing that. Hey, Drift Glass, how are the Internet Kitties doing this week? Well, Blue Gal, the Internet Kitties wish Jimmy and Rosalind Carter a happy 75th wedding anniversary, which is 15 marriages in Republican years. Let's think about living. Let's think about loving. Let's think about the hooping and the hopping and the bopping and the loving, loving, dubbing. Let's forget about the whining and the crying, the shooting and the dying, and the fellow with a switchblade knife. Let's think about living. Let's think about life. The Professional Left Podcast is recorded under a Creative Commons license. Copyright 2021 DGBG Productions.